All right, hello, welcome back to another tutorial. Today I'm going to be telling you about programming in Game Maker language and give you a lot of uh, sort of basic information about how to program in the Game Maker language from a perspective of Mani. Now, if you're familiar at all with Game Maker language, this tutorial is likely redundant. You will want to skip it. I'm not going to be covering any more advanced topics, and I'm not going to be covering in to, to much degree, the nuances of using UMT or understanding how to modify uh, GML code. You might pick something up if you're more of an intermediate than an advanced user, but still I would recommend uh, just skipping to the next tutorial if this is going to start sounding like old news to you. But for those of you who don't have a background in coding, I will be happy to share everything that I know, or at least everything that I've managed to write down. I've actually made a little bit of a list in one of my notebooks. I recommend keeping a notebook when you work on projects like these. It's great for organizing your thoughts. It really is almost mandatory for uh, reverse engineering projects. I'll talk about reverse engineering and what the process is for that mentally in a different video. But for now we're just going to cover some basic concepts that you need to know if you're going to alter the programming of a game. So I've already pulled up. I've made a brief example project. It's very, very simple. Right now it looks like this. It's nothing but this square, which is called object zero, inside of an otherwise empty room. That's it. There's nothing else to it. It's very straightforward. It, there's not even an actual game here. It doesn't take user input at all. And there's several different events that I've uh, given to this object. I've actually had to make it in a slightly older version of Game Maker Studio since the 2.3 version was giving me some issues when I tried to make a demonstration. But let's just hop right into it. Now, actually, I'm going to start in the draw event. Oh. My apologies, I didn't mean to click that. That's just the graph view. You never need to touch that if you're not a tool developer. That's not important. But we'll get started. This is what our draw event looks like. Uh, now, I've actually written out explicitly this draw event that will draw self. The sprite on this object is just that square we saw earlier. Nothing special. Now, this isn't actually necessary if this were all that I was going to do. It would, do, it would draw the object without a draw event just by itself. But if I do add one, then I get to actually control the specific behavior. We'll sort of give a basic example to show how we can modify this. Uh, we'll make it draw a, us a little message, and we'll just use the default font, print it in uh, white text. And if I save that very, very quickly, we can just see that our changes have taken effect. That's uh, one of the... Uh, there's, several, there's many, many different methods that you can use for drawing. I'll uh, actually show you how you can search for these methods since they're not necessarily very obvious, but that'll be at the end of the video. You'll just kind of have to take this for granted while I'm working through it. And uh, we've given it actually three parameters. Uh, the various pieces of data that we give to a function are called parameters. A parameter is essentially just something that we tell it about how it should uh, operate. In this case, we've given it uh, first an X position, then a Y position, and then a message to display. And that's what it no has to accept to know what to do. So if we change any of these, the uh, output that it will deliver will also be altered. So if we, uh, for example, say it's 40, zero. Uh, hold on then it will actually change what position it gets drawn at. And this is just very, very basic things. And the first one is, of course, the X position. And uh, if you remember your uh, pre-algebra, the X position on the graph is where it is horizontally. So moving it forward and the X dimension will actually uh, move it a bit to the right. The Y dimension at counter, intuitively, if you've taken pre-algebra, actually moves it down. So zero, zero is the top left and anything larger will move it uh, down and to the right. So 4040 would actually be uh, just a bit down and to the right. So we could see that that's where it ends up. And now I'm going to introduce to you the first concept that we're going to discuss, which is variables. 
what is a variable? A variable is essentially a way for us to store and modify data while the game is running. So I have this thing that draws text, and I've said it will always draw the same message every single time. And that's all well and good, except when it isn't, which is most of the time. So we're going to create what's called a variable in order to determine which message exactly we display. In this case, we'll just set it to the same value we already have. This isn't really showing off why you use variable, but just shows off how they work. And now I've assigned this variable, I've called it message, and I've given it the value hello. In this case, our variable message is holding a string data type. Strings are used to represent text. So this can be words, sentences, it can also be things like file names, or just really any sequence of letters, numbers, or symbols that a computer can uh, support. And instead of uh, actually giving it specifically uh, the draw text parameter, we can, instead of giving a message directly, we can actually just use a variable in its place. And it will work just the same. Let me demonstrate that real quickly. So you'll notice that this doesn't look any different, despite the changes we've made. Now, an important thing to understand is that variables can be modified as the program executes. So... Uh, I can, in the very next line, uh, reassign it, and now the program will change to reflect that fact. This also brings us to another important uh, concept of programming, the execution order of programs. The lines in a program are going to be executing one after another in sequence. The first line to be uh, interpreted is going to be this one where we assign the value of hello to message. However, because we assign the value of goodbye immediately afterwards, the first line is rendered essentially moot, and that is what our message is by the time it actually draws it. So that's what execution order is. It's just the order in which we uh, perform these instructions, and it's going to, broadly speaking, start at the top and end at the bottom for each of these uh, different events. Now there are other types of variables as well. Variables can be a lot of different things. And GML is a not a strongly typed language, so you can change the type that a variable has on the fly. So I can also make my variable message equal to a number. Now if I want to display a number instead of a string, I have to uh, first uh, convert it to a string so that we can uh, display it properly. If I do that now, it should display the number 12. And it has. Okay, that's the point where 2.3 let me down a bit, so I'm glad that that's working here. Uh, me mess our message variable can also hold uh, other types of data, so it can also hold uh, what are called Boolean values. Now, the word Boolean is probably uh, not familiar to too many of you. It would be spelled out like this, but a Boolean can be one of either two values, and this is where they're going to start sounding familiar. They can be either 1 or 0. So it's essentially representing a single bit of data. However, for uh, simplicity's sake, we will write them as either true or false. True being 1, false being 0. So if I do that, you'll notice they are just 1 and 0 underneath. So the moment I click off, it just converts it to that because that's how it's represented in the underlying programming. But that's not going to be so important. Now, you just need to understand that uh, true and false are concepts that you have to be familiar with. Uh, next, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about arithmetic. Because I've already told you that these uh, variables can hold numbers, but we can also perform math with these numbers quite simply. So if I have two variables for right now, We'll call them A and B, and we'll assign them values of 1 and 2. Now, if I want to add those two numbers together and display their result, I could simply do this. I could uh, convert the value of A plus B to a string and then display it. And this works for all of the mathematical operations. It works for addition. Ooh, that's not right. I forgot to save. Silly me. 
Uh, that's another like a quirk. You have to actually click off of whatever you're working on before it'll save properly. Now, now it'll be what we're expecting. One plus two is of course three. Uh, you could also do uh, stuff like subtraction. Very, very st straightforward. And that just uses the plus and minus symbols. And it will handle negative numbers like, like we see here. Multiplication is represented by this asterisk. Division is represented by the slash here. There's also exponentiation, which is represented by a caret. So a to the power of b in this case, which would just be 1 again. 1 to the power of anything else is simply 1. Another operation that you will find useful, but maybe haven't heard so much about in math courses is the modulo. So, for example, if I have a modulo b, and you're probably kind of wondering, what does that do? What does that mean? What is a modulo? Well, if we divide two numbers by each other, let's say we have 5 divided by 4. If you remember your uh, elementary school arithmetic, you'll notice that, uh, you're, well, you won't notice it, but you'll simply remember that uh, when we're performing a division, there is a part that can be uh, divided out wholly. So if we're dividing out 5 by 4, there is a 1. Uh, and then there's, of course, the 1.25. That 0.25 part, that fractional part, can also be represented as a remainder. In this case, the remainder of a division of 5 by 4 is 1. When we perform a modulo operation, this is actually what we are looking for. So 5 mod 4 is actually equal to 1. Similarly, 9 mod 4 would also be equal to 1, as would 13, 17, 21, etc. But that's what modulo does, and it's actually quite useful to uh, have that on hand. That's going to cover the basics of arithmetic. Uh, next, we're going to start talking a bit about conditionals. So there are several different types of conditionals, that, but they all follow the same basic structure. So I've set up in uh, other events here, you can't see it, but there's a variable I've called frame counter, and every single frame it will increment. So if I just quickly, I'll just show you that it's uh, working in the background, so I don't need to demonstrate it too much. Oh, I have to convert this to a string, that's right. Wouldn't want to uh, disobey my own advice. You can see that this is a ticking up every single frame, which is very, very fast. I believe the GMS2 runs at 30 FPS by default. And I can do some interesting things with that frame counter now. So I can say if frame counter uh, mod 5 equals 0. So this will run every fifth frame. Then I draw itself. This will cause our sprite to flash somewhat. This shouldn't be too bad for any people out there who have epilepsy, but uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, if I drag the window, it will of course pause, but so this is what it happens if we draw only every fifth frame. And that's what an if statement looks like. An if statement has essentially two parts to it. We have the condition and we have the body. The condition is the code that we evaluate to see whether we should run the body. And the body is, of course, the code that gets performed if the statement is, or if the condition is true. In our case, our condition is that frame counter mod 5 is equal to 0. Notice that we use a double equal sign here. Previously, when we were assigning variables, we would use a single equal sign. The double equal sign is to differentiate these two aspects. This is important because if we did, if frame counter mod 5 equals 0. Oh, wait, I have to actually tab off. Oh, wait, hey, it automatically corrects. That's nice. Glad that they don't let you make that mistake. But if you had actually set it to single equals, it would have just never displayed it. Because frame counter mod 5 equals 0. Well, that just has a value of 0 because that's what you've assigned it. And it would just give you zero every frame, and it would never display our sprite. Actually, I think it might just crash outright. But 
to get back to where I was trying to go, uh, double equals is what we use to check if two things are the same. And that's what you're going to want to use in an if statement to see if two things are identical. There are several other uh, methods that you can use to create conditionals for if statements. So for example, if I have uh, two booleans and I want to uh, decide whether to act based on some combination of the uh, booleans being true or false, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about what logic like that looks like. So if I create some booleans, then I can actually evaluate them in conjunction in a number of different ways. So if I type out something like this, and you're probably wondering what these are. First, these are uh, the characters by themselves are called pipes. They'll be most likely right above your enter key, and they'll come up when you're pressing shift. But putting two of them together is what we use to represent an or statement, a logical or statement. What that means is that if either of our booleans that we're giving it are true, or if both of them are true as well, then it will evaluate this as also being true. So in this case, uh, it should draw it every single frame because at least one of our uh, provided arguments to the or statement is true. If we save this real quickly. And you can see that's displaying every single frame. If we were to uh, switch these around, it still works if we are to set both of them to be true. It should be the same thing. However, if we were to set both of them as being false or to being zero, then what happens is we get nothing. And you see there's no, we're not displaying our sprite here, we're not drawing it anymore. That's how the logical or statement works. There are other logical operators you can use. Another one you'll probably use quite a lot is logical and. And this only evaluates the true if both items are also, both of the items we're evaluating are true. So in this case, I've set both of them to be equal to true. And it will display like we were expecting. But if I set even one of them to be false, then it no longer appears. Another one you'll use quite commonly is, well, we've explained what equals does, but uh, putting an exclamation mark in an equals sign does the opposite. And this is uh, what's called not equals. So if the two values being compared are different, then it will return true. So if we save that, since right now we have uh, our two values are not the same, then this will draw. Similarly, we can use not on its own as a way of reversing any Boolean value. So right now, my Boolean is equal to 1, which is true. But if we place an exclamation mark in front of it, that will uh, essentially give us the opposite of that Boolean value. The opposite of true is, of course, false. So when I run it, it will fail to display the spray. Uh, hold on. I forgot to save that properly. There we go. And as you can see, because I put an exclamation mark on it and reverse its value, this will evaluate as false and will not run the block. Now blocks right now, this uh, sort of uh, body of code that the if statement is controlling is very, very small. But using curly braces, we can make it as long as we want. So we can add some more statements to it, and I'll just add some more to demonstrate. And we can extend that for as many lines of code as we want. Now let's actually just change this so it actually does run so that you could see that my changes had an effect. 
And you can see that it's also displaying our new text message at the top here as well. Now, sometimes you may wish to also include what's called an else statement. So if we have an if statement and our condition evaluates to true, then it will execute the code in this block. However, if our statement instead evaluates to false, it will execute code in the else block. So I'll just put some text here. And you can see that it will actually just simplify away the curly braces because the curly braces are only necessary if you have a multi-line uh, block of code. If it's uh, only a single line being executed, it will just automatically execute the line right after the uh, if or else or whatever else, uh, what other, other kind of statement you're using automatically and that alone. But if we now uh, make it so that the if statement evaluates to false, save it, and you can see that our, the code in our else statement was executed instead. That is how conditionals work. You will also see the uh, use of what are called loops. This is a very, very important concept if you're a programmer or if you're planning to do any programming. The most basic kind of loop in the game maker is what's called the repeat loop. Now our repeat loop just executes the same piece of code over and over and over again. Now for our sake, we'll just uh, make something very simple. Another arithmetic operator that you may use is what's called the uh, increment operator. This is essentially a shorthand, so instead of typing out, you would just type out what I've typed above it. That saves you some time. Uh, there are actually other uh, operators that are similar, so minus minus does the opposite. It's called a decrement and we're decreased by one, but we're just gonna have a counter that increases by one each time we repeat. And repeat 10, just that just means it will run this block of code 10 times. So let's just say draw text zero uh, counter times 20. This message is being repeated. And you'll notice that this message appears 10 different times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Other than that, it's it's the same every time. The repeat counter doesn't uh, do anything else. It will always execute exactly 10 times. No more, no less. However, if we wanted to end this early, we would use what's called a break statement. Whoa. That was not what I was expecting to happen. Uh, well, I'm just gonna undo that. We'll pretend that we didn't see that. I will bring back the break statement later because I'm afraid GML is being funny today. Instead, I'll just introduce the next kind of loop. This is sort of the uh, uh, bigger brother of the repeat loop. It's called a for loop. And we can do pretty much the exact same thing that we just did with it. And in general, you're recommended to use for loops instead of repeats almost always. Either a for loop or a while loop. Now, if we do that, it will have. Uh, effectively the same outcome. Let's change it slightly so that you can see that it's different. Very, very straightforward, although I made it overlap the frame counter by mistake. And the basic explanation for what's happening up here is that there are three parts to a for loop. You have to separate each of them with a semicolon to indicate where one ends and the other begins. 
Uh, the first one is called the initialization. The initialization essentially is where you're required to define in what's called an iterator and variable. The iterator is what controls how many times the for loop executes. And there are, there's a lot more dynamism here than in the repeat loop. So in this case, I'm using them essentially interchangeably, but more complex behavior is allowed. Uh, the second part is called the condition. Every time that the for loop is set to execute its block of code, it first evaluates the conditional. If the conditional evaluates to true, it does execute the block of code, but if it evaluates the false, the for loop is over and we skip over it to the next part of the code. The third part is called, I don't remember what it's called exactly, but it's usually where you just write I plus plus. That's almost always what you're doing. It's just incrementing your counter variable. But you can do other things. You can do, for example, I minus minus or I plus three. But the gist is that this is where you modify your variable each time the loop runs. So after the loop is finished, but before we decide whether or not to run the loop again, we have to apply this modification to our iterator variable. And like I said, this will usually just be I plus plus, which increases I by one, but sometimes it's other stuff. Those are the three basic parts of a for loop that you need to understand. And lastly, there's what's called the while loop. This is probably the simplest of the bunch, but it's also very, very flexible. And now a while loop will always execute as long as a condition is true. So for our condition, we'll just uh, sort of rehash the exact same thing, but this isn't usually how you'll use a while loop. Hold on, uh, I'm to look at this is slightly. Ah, well, there you go. It just simplifies away the while loop. But basically what would, would have happened if UMD wasn't undermining me at every turn is that a while loop actually just executes what's in its bounds as long as the condition that it's uh, attached to is true. So in this case, as long as the counter is less than 10, it will execute what's in it. And the moment that condition ceases to be false, or ceases to be true, rather, it will uh, stop doing so. It essentially uses the same logic as an if statement, if that helps you what you want. So if that helps you at all. Uh, lastly, I want to show you where you can find out more about the game maker language. So I use a lot of just random uh, functions here. And uh, stuff like draw text or draw self, these aren't really obvious functions. So there's actually a reference that you can go to. I'll link this in the description. But this gives you a basic overview of the language features, and it gives you a place where you can find out more about things like drawing sprites, collision detection, and just handling all sorts of things in Game Maker itself. And that's kind of a good uh, material to reference while you're working, uh, because you'll often find a lot of Game Maker's built-in functionality being utilized, and you might not understand exactly what's going on. This is a good place to start. Again, this was meant to be more of a basic primer to understanding the concepts of programming. This is not so much specifically for Game Maker, but just programming in general. And I'm trying to give you the fast version. If you need more uh, explanation, there are some other channels out there that have great tutorials in Game Maker language, I'm sure. And you might get a lot of uh, utility out of those as well. Anyways, hopefully this will have been useful to you. I'm going to be uh, calling that a video for now. Uh, if this was useful, please leave me a like and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting more tutorials in the future. And have a great day.